morning. Today we are doing another interview, this time with Victoria Whiting, who is a PhD student at the University of Bolton in the School of Education Psychology. And your research area is on autism, am I correct? Yes, yeah, that's right. Autism research. How exciting. So how, you know what we're doing with these podcasts, we're talking about everybody's educational journey. And so I guess that's where we're going to start is to find out how education's been for you along the years and kind of how you've ended up where you are and then where you want to see yourself. Okay, so my educational journey has been, it's like a roller coaster. It started off quite rough. Um, It's taken a few dips. In primary school, I didn't really, I can't remember much from my primary school like experiences because I was so young. Um, I know I had difficulty with like writing and reading and things like that. It was high school that was the most impactful, I'd say, because I was bullied. I wasn't very academic. I found things really difficult in terms of like the workload and like processing everything I had to do. And I didn't have friends or anything, so that made it harder. And then that really put me off because I never thought I'd go to university at all. I never thought that I was intelligent enough to do that. But when I came to the University of Bolton to do my, it was my undergraduate degree in psychology, that's when I realised that, okay, no, maybe you can do this. Maybe this is something that, you're interested in so just go for it and then in my second year of university I was diagnosed as autistic so that is where the research my interests come from and I did I found my undergraduate degree quite difficult because there is there's lots of work and I've never had to write that much or do that those that amount of like essays and I'm really bad with exams But I think the one thing that helped me pretty much from when I started in first year all the way to now is like the staff and the support that I've got, because without that, I wouldn't be where I am. And I've had like my supervisor is um, Dr. Vital Pedro, and he kind of saw my potential and he's like, I know you can do this. So let's do it. We're going to do all this amazing research and That is why I decided to essentially do my master's degree and then go on to do my PhD because I had all these ideas that I wanted to kind of research and all these things that I wanted to do based off my experiences and to have the support of someone saying, yeah, we'll do it together really, really helped. So I never intended to to do this. I never thought I would until like my first year and then in my first year I was like okay so I'm going to do this for three years and then I'm going to do my master's and then I'll do my PhD but I never thought I would actually get here because of my previous like troubles with education but yeah that is essentially it. Wow I find it so interesting what you say because I think you hit the nail on the head when you said it's a lot of the time it's the support it's the support around you that gives you that belief within yourself because I know we were talking before we started this and I was telling you a little bit about me and that's exactly why I'm here too something that happened to me and then the support that I had from my um, supervisor it's just paramount isn't it it really is and I think that's what is great about the University of Bolton is that personal Um, relationship between us and our supervisors or not just the supervisors it's other staff members as well isn't it yeah definitely the whole campus everyone is just so friendly and they're really welcoming and even when you're going to get a drink in the morning you're just having a chat with someone and it makes such a huge difference and because the campus is so small you do get that kind of one-to-one support and it's so nice for people to actually say yeah I believe in you it makes it just it changes everything yeah I feel seen for the first time I know that sounds a bit cheesy but that's how I feel at Bolton I feel like people actually see me whereas before it was like you're there you're kind of an employee or you're you know whatever you was doing in my life but nobody really saw me and now 
it's quite alien because I can't look around at time thinking, oh, you're actually listening to me. <laughs> you're actually talking to me and you, you know that person that you're saying can do this you mean me not somebody else still behind me that's it I get like really bad like imposter syndrome and I tell myself oh you know you, you can't do it you have all these past experiences you know it's not going to work out you know you're not that good and then for someone to turn around and say no you are that good I'm talking about you it it, it does make a difference and it makes you think that okay well Maybe if someone else thinks that, then maybe I should change my mindset and think that too. And then your whole work ethic and everything just changes and shifts and everything kind of like falls into place. Yeah. Suddenly you do better, don't you? Because for me, I also don't want to let them down because they've got that belief in me. So I need to make sure that I carry on. Otherwise, if, if I don't, then I've let them down. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's like that. It's like suddenly you wake up one day and you think, I can actually do this. Yeah. That's it. And you think to yourself, oh, I'm doing a PhD. Maybe I can do it. Because it's all, I've always thought of like doing a PhD as this really big thing. When you break it down, it's not. It's just loads of little bits of research that come together, I guess. But for you to like tell yourself, you can do a PhD and everyone else thinks you can do it. It's a big thing. Yeah, of course it is. Okay, so... um. You told me an awful lot there. It's really interesting. So obviously in school, you had a really tough time. Um, I mean, how did you deal with being bullied? Did you have any support with that? I didn't. Only the support from um, my parents, essentially, because I I was so different to everyone around me. Like I socialised different. I dressed different. I had like different interests and at that time in high school, I was kind of, I was still playing with Barbie dolls and like toys and things like that. And everyone else was like into boys and makeup and I just wasn't. So it was really difficult for me to connect with people. And because of that, that is why I was bullied like so heavily. And I was undiagnosed at that point. So no one really could kind of say, oh, well, this is why. And I did tell the teachers and things like that, but it's always the same thing. They try and help, but sometimes that makes it worse. So the only really support that I got was from my parents. And even then, they didn't really understand the extent of what was going on because I'd spend ages in the morning like crying because I I didn't want to go to school. I just didn't want to be there. So it was, it was really hard. But now as an adult, I found that I have more understanding, like self-understanding and self-acceptance. And I think that helps in a way. I've come to like, I've grown up and I've come to terms with everything and it doesn't necessarily bother me as much now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know whether this is the same for you, but for me, it's more about what's happened to me has happened to me. Now it's about me trying to help and make changes and use my research to help others so they don't go through what I went through or deal with it, that, you know, have the same things happen. I know it's very different what we're, we're researching, but I feel like the ethos is the same. <clears throat> yeah, it's that kind of, I want to use my experiences and do all this research so that other children don't have to go through that so that, People can read this research, like teachers and parents can read it and be like, oh, okay, I understand now. This is what we need to do to change things. Why do you think they missed it? Or how? How could you, how could you miss it? I, I mean, I think I hid a lot of it a lot of the time. So I would go home and like research everything that everyone was into. So I'd go into school and I'd be, I'd be able to have these conversations with people because I'd done all the research and I, I pretended that I knew what they were talking about a lot of the time. But there were like instances where people kind of, people made can fun I, of me because. Can I just say, I did that in my undergraduate de- degree. I just pretended I knew what they were on about. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I, do, I still do that. But it's just kind <laughs> of, it's like people still made fun of me because I was so different and because I socialize what, weird what was and different about you what was different and you say I was different but mm-hmm. how so I processed things a lot slower than the people around me so someone would ask me a question 
and I just either say I don't know or just stare at them like just full on stare at them because I didn't know what to say and then I took things very literally as well so someone said to me once like I think it was in terms of like work and stuff they said you need to pull your socks up so I said well I was like why my socks are already like pulled up so I took things very literally in that sense and I think because I liked heavy metal music and I dressed in black and things like that people didn't really understand me either so that was really difficult so I think that's why I was picked on so much because I was so different to everyone else they just they didn't understand it and because I hid everything and I tried to come across as so knowledgeable. I just wasn't picked up. And at the time, like my teachers and my parents didn't really know much about what autism was. So my parents didn't really see anything as different because they didn't know what they were looking for. Yeah. So. Now, I don't know if I'm right in saying, so I don't really know much about autism, but is it is it mainly, are boys mainly diagnosed earlier? with autism is it something that you look for more in boys than you do with girls generally yeah boys are more picked up because they tend to present more outwardly and more obvious signs and symptoms whereas girls mask but if I'm being honest anyone can present with any traits um so boys and men can mask as well but that means they go undiagnosed and unsupported as well yeah. Um, but generally, yeah, because a lot of the time women mask, they don't get picked up on and they are generally diagnosed later in life. Which is what happened to you. Yeah, which is exactly what happened to me. <laughs> yeah. So when you when you sort of left school, what happened then? Did you go on to college? I did. I did A levels, which I found more enjoyable because at that point I had friends, but I wasn't necessarily interested because in the subjects, I didn't do psychology at A-level because I thought it was too hard. And a few of my friends did it and they were telling me, I remember they were telling me all the things they'd learned about Sigmund Freud. And I'd, I'd sit there and I'd be like, that sounds really interesting. And they'd be like, it is, but it's really hard. So I wouldn't do it. So I didn't do it. I did like health and social care instead. Right. And then after I had my A-levels, I did go to university and I, I think I was doing an education degree, but I dropped out because it wasn't what I wanted to do. I yeah. found it too difficult and there was too much pressure and I just thought, I don't want to do it. So that, at that point, I went into employment, which again, didn't go very well. Um, and then after that, I actually did It was an access to education course in Manchester with someone I knew. And that was it. We did. It was all about like education and educational policy. But alongside of that, we did psychology. And I remember one of the things that we looked at was, you know, the Stanford prison experiment. Yes. I don't know why, but I love that experiment there's something about it that I, it just draws me in and we studied that for a while and I thought okay this is what this is what I want to do I want to go into psychology yeah and at that point that is when I applied to go to university so that was my first experience with psychology but up until that point I didn't really have an interest in going to university I thought it was the right thing to do because that's what people did. They did their A-levels, they went to university and then this and this and this. But it just, it didn't work that way for me. No. I mean, thinking about your school experience, which sounds like you had a real torrid time, what was it that kept you in education? I feel like some people would have that experience who would run a mile because, you know, they've had, it's just been terrible for them. I think it was, the motivation and the drive more than anything because I at first I just knew I want to do psychology that's what I want to do and then in my first year I think I went to one of Pedro's lectures and I was like that's it that's what I want to do now I'm, I'm sticking to that that is it so all yeah. the way through I've known that this is what I want to do and this yeah. is how I'm going to get there 
So it's very like rigid thinking, but it's just knowing that this is the way to do what I want to do. And this is how I need to get there. So I've always had that motivation yeah. because I know that I need to be in education to, to get to that point. But if I didn't have the motivation and the want to do it, I, I would have like dropped out ages ago. Yes, of course. What do you think school could have done better for you? I think it's a hard one. I think them having more understanding, because even though I wasn't diagnosed, there was clearly like I had difficulties, like especially with like academic work and things like that. So I think just having more understanding that some children don't have a diagnosis for whatever reason that may be, but they still need help and they should still get help because I didn't enjoy school because of that. Um, Education in this country, I think, is so behind. I really do. We seem to still be sticking to this really old fashioned view of education is one way. And, you know, you just front load the students with maths, English, science and talk at them and then shoo them off and expect them to to suddenly become geniuses. And it didn't work for me. I came out, I think I had two GCSEs and the rest were sort of D's and E's. Um, I don't think they're called that anymore now. The numbers, aren't they? But um, and it's like my son now, my son's 13 going into year nine this September. He hates school. He hates it because it's just not engaging. It's just not interesting. And I just feel it just needs an overhaul. It really does. I think that if you're doing something you're interested in, I know that from year seven to what year 11, even when you get to choose your options, there's not much choice. You no. can't do a GCSE in psychology or no. anything like that. You have to do maths, like you said, English, science. I did drama, I did IT, and I did cookery, and I did music um, because I thought, oh, well, I like these things. But then I turned out, no, I don't like them. And I didn't have, I didn't have the interest. I think if something like psychology was an option, I would have picked it and I would have enjoyed it. But they're very stuck in you have to do set things. And those set things are not always interesting or engaging. So why do I want to come to school if I'm not interested in it? And that is an incredibly interesting theme that I'm finding from speaking to people. You know, I've done probably the best part of 25 interviews now with different academics, different people. And the huge theme coming out is that lack of engagement in school and the amount of them that um, have almost kind of missed that section because they didn't, it just didn't do it for them. And then they've got to college or to university where suddenly they're interested and boom, that's where they start to fly. So there's got to be something in it but who do we tell I think I think as well it, the teachers make a huge difference because my drama teacher at GCSE and A level he was great he was so enthusiastic and you could tell he wanted to be there and he yeah. had so much passion and he was so over the top and I loved that and I was interested because I wanted to be there yeah whereas like my maths teacher you, would, you could tell that they were there because they had to be there and that they were teaching the same old boring maths and they didn't they weren't interested either and I think that makes a huge difference when you get to university especially in the psychology department you have lecturers who have their special interests and in what they specialize in and they are so passionate about that and that kind of leaks onto you a little bit you pick up on that and you think they're interested I'm interested we yeah. both want to be here and it just it makes a difference makes a huge difference makes a huge difference I don't know how we ever get to change that and I, th I worry and I wonder how many we lose along the way like my son my son is not engaged in school and there is no way he will continue his education after school he wants to just get an apprenticeship and get some sort of yeah. learning in a job which is fine that's what he wants to do I'm not going to you know make him do something different but it just feels a real shame because he's a smart switch on by but he's just not he's just not feeling it yeah I think something definitely does need to change but like you say I don't know how you'd change it no you'd have to look at like exam boards and curriculum and do like a massive like overhaul and yeah start from scratch I guess which would take a long time and it would cost a lot of money and resources and people 
are scared of change and people aren't willing to change. So that makes it really difficult as well. Yeah, it does. Okay, so moving on, well, back to you at university. How did you start that conversation or who started that conversation with you to say, oh, we think you might need a diagnosis or you, you think there might be something? What, how did that happen? It started when I was about 17. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how I came, I came to it. I know that when I started my degree, I already had suspicions. Um, and then listening to Pedro's lectures, I thought, yeah, I have more suspicions now. And I think he kind of knew as well. And my parents just knew. So that kind of, that was kind of it. My mum kind of realised that she'd been working in special education for a while. And she thought, oh, you're doing all these things. And do you know you do these things? You're ticking all these boxes. And I was like, yeah, I know. And I've had these lectures at uni and yeah, I just know. So that is how I decided that now is the time. I'd previously, in my first year, um, I'd been referred for a diagnosis. So I've got dyslexia and dyspraxia as well. And that was done within the university. But the autism diagnosis was done like through my GP and everything. And I just thought, just try and find out, I guess. I just had these suspicions and I wanted like confirmation and validation. And I just went to the GP and got the ball rolling and, and that was it. It just happened that it was in like my second year of university. What difference has it made to you? A huge difference I mean it's helped me in terms of like I get technology and stuff and things like learning aids and that's really helpful and it's helpful for like teaching staff to know um, because sometimes I need like notes in advance or to record the lectures just certain little things but personally for me it's it's helped me because I've rediscovered like who I am again because I can look at my childhood and be like oh okay that's why I did that thing. I, I get it. That's fine. These are the mistakes I've made. These are the things I've done, but it's made me who I am. And now looking forward, I can think that, ah, oh, I've got all these experiences so that I can put into something like doing the PhD and doing the research. So it's helped me personally, academically. It's helped me like in like every aspect of my life, pretty much. Yeah. So what is your research? What are you looking to do? So I am looking at contributing to diagnosis. So at the moment, diagnosis is very black and white. It's very male and female, but I want to kind of change that. So I'm looking at, they call it kind of atypical traits. So the way our traits are manifested and the way autistic people like present their say symptoms. But so I'm looking at that. So it, it's, Going off like my undergraduate piece of research, because that looked at the fact that men and young boys can camouflage because people think that camouflaging is restricted to females, but it's not. So I'm looking at characterizing these set of atypical traits and saying these are traits that are currently not looked at within diagnosis. This is what we mean by atypical. This is what these traits are. And this is what we need to do moving forward. So that hopefully all these things that I'm picking out can then be used within diagnosis to kind of help people so they don't get misdiagnosed and don't get late diagnosed so that they can realise that, oh, I never thought of this one. Maybe we can add that to our screening measures so that it's easier to identify people like at a young age. And would you think about rolling that through to schools? So education within teacher training or uh, I don't know yeah I, th I think that'd be really really helpful because I know within it depends where you live I guess I know in some services they do go to schools and ask for like school reports and observations and things like that from teachers so for teachers to have an understanding of these traits that are maybe less obvious less subtle that are not as well known would be really helpful because then teachers might be more able to pick out students that they think might need a diagnosis. How important is that diagnosis early? I think it makes a huge difference because you get access to support. Adult support services are 
very scarce. There's not a lot of support out there for adults. So it helps in terms of that. It helps for school support. But it also gives a child some kind of understanding because I went through my childhood and I was I was weird and I didn't know who I was and I didn't have friends and I was bullied. And if I'd have known earlier on that this is why, I could say to people, oh, well, this, this is why I'm autistic. This is why I do these things. And I would have accepted myself a lot sooner and it, it would have changed everything. You know, it's really interesting you say that. I have two very good friends of mine. I've got one who has a son. They're both actually the same age as these children. One who has a son, one who has a daughter. Um, and whenever we talk about autism, one parent will say, I, I, admit, I can't remember which way around it is now, so I'm just going to take a shot. But my son has autism. But then the other friend <sighs> says, my daughter is autistic. Um, so that like that subtle change in language And it's really interesting talking to them. One will say, well, no, no, autism isn't him. It's not who, it's not what defines him. It's just something he has. What would you, what do you think about that? Oh God, this, people have like so many heated debates about this. So with autism, autism is not an accessory. It's not like a shopping bag. It's not a thing I carry around with me with autism. Autistic is my identity. It's who I am. It's part of me. I am autistic. I don't carry autism with me. Um, and that that is it. I also don't like when they say like disorder or yeah. they say autism is a mental health condition. It's not. Autism is it's a neurodevelopmental disability. So everything's going on in my brain. Um, so I say I say condition a lot of the time because it sounds a lot nicer than you have a disorder, I guess. Yeah. But it, yeah I'm, not, I'm not a fan of how we medicalise everything. Is it not just as simple as whether you have blonde hair or brown hair or ginger hair? It's just something yeah. that you are. Does it even have to be a disability? Or or does it does it depend on kind of where you are on the spectrum? I know I've had interesting conversations with Pedro about the spectrum. He doesn't like that. Um, but does it does that make a difference? Not really. The thing, the thing with the spectrum is people use the terms like high functioning and low functioning, but that is awful, I think, because how do you determine whether someone is high functioning? I was so, just going to say that. Where, where's your benchmark for that then? What, what is a high functioning person? Does it mean you're good at maths? Does it mean you can drive? I don't know. That's it. It depends. It's very situational. So people look at me and think that, oh, she's high functioning. She can hold a conversation. But what they don't realize is that today I can hold a conversation. After this, I'll probably spend the next three days in bed because it's so exhausting. And I can't go to the shops on my own. I can't travel on my own. There's a lot of things that I can't do. But because people think I'm high functioning, it's like it depends how someone functions changes on a daily basis. So to label someone as high functioning it doesn't really work because they it's might they, really that, isn't it? they might come across as high functioning one day, but the next day they might be having like meltdowns and it, it honestly just changes from day to day. So you can't say someone's high functioning or low functioning because you it changes so much. Oh my gosh, I've got so many questions. So little time. <laughs> it's so interesting, isn't it? I think language matters. I think how we understand not just autism just in general you know it crosses it actually crosses into lots of different areas doesn't it you talk about there's huge discussions at the moment over black lives matter and about how you know being seen and and language and oh oh, i could just my brain's just racing on lots of different uh, areas right now um well, yeah, it does. It makes a huge di- it makes a huge difference. It really does. The language you use when you when you're talking to someone or talking about something, it it can be really impactful. Yeah, and I I probably have been um, one of those people that have said the wrong thing, and I don't mean to say the wrong thing. It's perhaps just something that I don't understand, or you know, I've read in the media or I've seen on TV. Um, 
because you know I, I bet this isn't something this is something you'll be you'll have people say to you all the time I've got Rain Man in the head the film Rain Man so it's like well where does he come on the spectrum is and is that a really bad thing to talk about is that just have I just fallen <laughs> down that slippery slope of typical people it's representation in movies and films we don't have much representation when people think of autism they think of a white cisgender male who presents very outwardly and acts like a certain way. So Rain Man would be, I've not seen it, but I, it's, that's the stereotypical view of what autism is to a lot of people. But yeah. I'm not like Rain Man. I don't present that way. And there's so many other people who present so differently. I mean, some people do present like that. Some people do present in a very stereotypical way. But there's so many other people. It's yeah, just that the, the media presents it in the same way over and over that you don't get to see who's out there. Is that a bad thing, though? Because at least for me, I've got something in my head to kind of think about. I mean, of course, I've got, like I said, I've got friends who have have got um, children who present very, very differently. Mm -hmm. And I've got a little bit more of an understanding, but I'm thinking just in general for people, is it good to have at least some kind of representation or not? Do you think it's more damaging? I think it's a bit of both. It's good that there is some representation, but then you get people, I've had people say to me, oh, you don't look autistic. Oh. And, I, and I'm like, oh. You mean it's not on your forehead? <laughs> it's like, I've seen this film and oh. you don't act like the person in the film or you don't act like my child. And I'm like, no, because not everyone acts the same. So in a way it can be damaging Yeah, because people just get this same view. And they don't realise that everyone's different. But again, it's a positive, I guess, because at least we have some representation. I, f- I feel like this is where having something called the spectrum makes it, it helps because that straight away tells me a spectrum is different. So you, I don't like the idea, like you say, with high function and low function. I don't think they should be the end point. But I like the idea of saying, you know, there's an autistic spectrum so you can fit onto that at different mm-hmm. points. So it makes your brain think that, you know, you're not all not all the same. Everybody's different. Yeah, it's not linear. It's it's not like this. It's a big, like massive, like colourful picture. But I, I get that. I kind of agree with that. So we fall somewhere on the spectrum at some point we're, we're, we're somewhere but the other thing that gets me is and I think this is more of an American thing people get diagnosed with mild autism oh. and it's like well I don't have spicy autism or barbecue flavored autism what is mild autism all these things that people say and it's just language yeah. language Ex- exactly yeah there really needs to be a better work, more work, some sort of campaigns. I don't know. I, I know my son, he was in school with one of the boys and it was really interesting how he um, interacted with him. And he was very protective of this boy, to be fair. He loves him. But then there were other children who would just laugh at him. And my son ended up not not very well. He ended up in a couple of fights over it because he just can't stand anybody being unkind. Um, but I think that's about lack of understanding as well, isn't it? With parents, I remember overhearing, um, it was a grandma actually who we would, we'd all, some after school thing. And she was complaining that this boy was in in her grandson's class because she was scared that her grandson would pick up on bad behaviour. That's all she could see was its bad behaviour. And I remember feeling really sad about that because it wasn't bad behaviour. He just wasn't, he wasn't dealt with very well. The school didn't understand it. They ended up getting a support worker in for him, which was brilliant. But uh, this was just before that happened. And it made me feel really sad because it was her lack of knowledge and understanding, really. And she was then having these discussions with other parents and they were all sitting there kind of slagging him off, really. That's awful. I think they think it's like, all bad behaviour, but it's like, well, his needs are obviously not being met. He's trying to tell you something and you're not picking up on it. Yeah. And a lot of parents, they don't have the understanding. I think if they knew that, that, okay, if someone sat down and told them, this is what it actually is. It's not bad behaviour, but it's always, oh, naughty child. And then all the parents do talk. And then, yeah, I'd feel bad for the child as well. 
Yeah, exactly. Do you know, another story. I, I was in Aldi just before Christmas. Aldi, I love Aldi. And um, there was this child, it was, it was a little girl who was having a complete meltdown in one of the aisles. Um, and I had, I had no idea what her meltdown was or whether it was anything to do with autism or not. But I just sort of, all these parents around and other, other not necessarily parents, but other adults in Aldi were tutting and kind of walking on past and you know, you can just see what people are saying and talking behind the back. And I just went over to her and said, you're doing a really good job. Do you need anything? And she burst into tears. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she told me that her daughter was autistic and was just having a meltdown. It was just too much. Yeah. It was just too much for her. Um, it's about being kind, isn't it? It's just recognize. Stop judging people. That's Judge it. Gentle. Stop judging. I, Do you think I, that mum is in all day, like loving it? raising around going yay my kids exactly. meltdown. look at me that's it I heard a story once and I don't I can't remember where I heard it from but this mother was shopping with her son and he stims so he makes noises and grunts and things like that to like express himself because um but they were in the shop and some woman actually passed comment and said you so I, I can't remember exactly what they said but it was something like why is your son making that noise it's it's scary what's he doing And this woman seemed terrified of this child. And I just thought, imagine coming up to someone and passing comment on someone else's child. As a parent, I I wouldn't know what to add to think. Someone's just said something about your child and it's like, why are you judging them? You don't know them. You don't know what they've been through or what they're going through. They've come to the shop to to shop. They don't need you kind of weighing in on, you know. And is that, I mean, you the context and how that's asked is interesting because I'm a big fan of asking questions. So if maybe you're curious and you say, I'm really sorry to ask, but why is your son making that noise? Is that a good thing, asking questions because you're trying to learn? It's how you say it though, isn't it? I think it is how you say it. I don't mind people asking questions. I'm very open to people asking me questions about things, but it does depend on like how you frame it and like the tone of voice you use and how yeah. it comes across. Cause it can be, yeah. see, be perceived in lots of different ways. So you have to be careful about that, but asking questions is generally a good thing. I think so anyway, cause how right. do you learn if you don't ask questions? Yeah, exactly. And then if you're having that conversation, other people might be around who listen and think, Oh, okay then. Yeah, and other people can pick up on it and then everyone learns something. Every day is a learning day. Yeah. So where is this going to take you in the future? What do you think in the future is going to hold for for your research? I have no idea. It scares me a little bit because everything is so unknown. I do want to do more research into diagnosis and diagnosis assessments and I would like to be involved in like making something new possibly yeah I'd like to do that but I'm not entirely sure what my future holds yet because I've got so much to do at the moment that's all I'm focused on that's all I'm thinking about at the moment yeah of course and we've sometimes we've just got to see where it takes us don't we yeah just just see where it leads see how this goes first and then see where my research is at at that point if it's changed if it's if there's anything new And then I can kind of see, well, where to go next. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, brilliant. Thank you so much for talking to me. 